introduce Dr. Stephen Inlow from the University of Florida Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. We've been working, I think, about five years together now. Yes, sir. Specifically on trying to improve our control of invasive weeds on our Florida installations. I have about five down in Florida that just struggles with Brazilian pepper and a number of others. And it occurred to us in our work together that uh, we're learning a lot. And Dr. Inlow can speak installations in very specific ge uh, geographic areas concerning their issues and tailor programs. And after talking about that, we thought, well, well let's open up what we're doing here to uh, outside of Florida. Well, why not in ex include our DOD and uh, brothers and sisters, the Navy and the Army, uh, specifically the Army, because I know we were just talking earlier, you just have huge amounts of, of land to, to, to try to work these very challenging plants. So we, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Inlow. He's a, 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 a national wide, nationwide authority in, in invasive plant control and surveillance. And the beauty of working with him I've learned is he looks at your programs. One of the things that DOD does, at least the Air Force, is we get stuck in our way. And we'll find something that works and stick with that uh, for decades in some cases. And we fail to do a good job of looking at the modern herbicides. And that's what Dr. Inlow does for us. The other thing he does, and I didn't realize this, was he looks at our techniques. He's looking at the efficiency of our time in the field. So he's looking at both our control measures, but how we do that. And today we're going to talk about uh, Phragmites, and next week we have Tree of Heaven. But Dr. Inlow, I'm going to pass this to you. You do a better job of introducing us as it is. So thanks, Dr. Inlow. All right. Uh, first off, Armando and, and Doug, thank you very much. Uh, for the opportunity to speak to the uh, Pest Management Board. <laughs> I'm really grateful and appreciative of, of these opportunities. And I'm really <laughs> excited and glad to engage with a lot of, of folks from across the country here to talk about quite possibly the absolute number one invasive uh, wetland uh, plant problem that we have. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. And we're going to jump into this. Let's see if that'll work. Okay, so um, it looks like it's working on mine. Uh, are we good uh, on screen sharing? Can everybody see my title slide? It looks yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we can, can see, see it, it uh, Dr. Enlow. Hey, this is, uh, this is Doug. Uh, just, a, just a quick uh, interruption, sir, before you get started. If you would, uh, yeah, I really, I, I wanted to thank you and, and uh, Armando for helping to coordinate this, but you in particular for uh, doing this for our DOD community. Uh, this this uh, invitation was sent out uh, pretty widely was sent out to uh, all the service leads for for natural resources and pest management, and the uh, the invasive species uh, uh, subcommittee, and, and also the National Military Fish and Wildlife Association uh, invasive species working group. So, so we have a super diverse group of people on here, including our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, our personnel that are joining us here. So uh, it looks like there's there's, there's uh, Maybe a hundred plus people on this, so uh, this is really means a lot to us. So we appreciate your time and effort. And and on, on behalf of uh, really of, of Colonel Mark Hart, the uh, uh, the director of the Pest Management Board, I'm not sure if he was able to join us today or not, but uh, I, I send out a, a warm and sincere thank you for for doing this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Um, OK, so what I want to do today, uh, we're going to talk Phragmites. Now, I, I suspect I'm not the first person on the planet to call it the mighty Phragmites. So if I have stolen or plagiarized that from you in your own talks, I apologize. Um, but I think the title really, you know, lays the heart of the problem out here is this is truly one of the most difficult invasive plant management issues that we face. And so <laughs> I think that I suspect if you are on here, you know Phragmites well. And, you know, these are just a few sort of iconic shots uh, of Phragmites, of, of the uh, very prolific flowers on the left there, of the, the dry down there in the uh, wintertime months where everything goes that dark brown, golden brown color, the dense rhizomes that you see, and then, of course, the uh, very aggressive uh, stem and, and leaf growth. Uh, so I'm getting a little feedback here. I'm not sure if that's from somebody else's. If if you don't mind muting, um, that might help. Okay. So 
Do you know that Phragmites is possibly one of the most well-studied plants uh, for non-crop natural areas across the world? Uh, it is an incredibly important genus worldwide and um, is an extremely important wetland species. Um, it's a species of conser important conservation status in many parts of the world. Um, unfortunately, um, although we have our native version of Phragmites here, uh, we do face it as more of an invasive plant problem than just about anything. <clears throat> and as such, over the last 20 years especially, there has been a tremendous increase in the study of Phragmites as an invasive plant in North America. And today you can survey hundreds and hundreds of papers, extension publications, websites, uh, with almost unlimited Phragmites information. Uh, there's lots of consistency among much of that information. There's some inconsistencies, but in general, it's sort of easy to get a deluge. And really, I do not want to overwhelm you with information today, but I have to confess, I've got a lot to say here. And I want to spend plenty of time at the end answering questions and sort of addressing more site-specific things uh, if they come up. And I want your feedback. Um, there is tremendous expertise among this audience uh, regarding Phragmites management. And I think that bringing people together or bringing this group together in this, uh, in this format sort of gives us the opportunity to allow for the sharing of a lot of that experience and expertise that might uh, sort of go unnoticed otherwise. So please, uh, as we move forward, get your questions into the chat. Um, I will plan to hang out as long as you want to after I am done talking here um, so that we can sort of get questions answered and, and uh, address issues as they move forward, okay? So here we go. <clears throat> the objectives again, <clears throat> we're going to go through some, some of the, the, the biological characteristics that I see as, as are critical. Identification comes up uh, as, a, as an issue, especially with Phragmites, uh, native, non-native, and now hybrids, and certainly the reproduction and spread issues. Most importantly to me is always a context of management. I'm an academic, but I am an academic that is absolutely inclined to study management outcomes and understanding better ways to deal with invasive plants. That is the heart of my program, and that's what I want to do today. I'm also going to frame a bit of this discussion, especially the second half, really from the perspective of what questions uh, you should be asking in your Phragmites management programs, okay? I'm not here to lay out an entire adaptive management plan for you. I'm not here to go through comprehensive review of Phragmites management in every single scenario that's out there. Um, but what I want to do is lay out a lot of basic information and principles that are going to be very applicable. And hopefully some things that you haven't heard before or you had not really been able to put together and bring some clarity, especially in some of the areas that you're struggling with Phragmites. And I suspect if I got a show of hands, um, I would have a, most of the audience would probably say, yeah, I've struggled with Phragmites at some point. Okay. Um, is the PowerPoint keeping up with me or have we moved on to the map now? Maybe. Yes, it was just a couple of second lag. Okay, all right. I'll be. I'll try to be careful. I've got things coming up one at a time, but uh, I'll try to be careful about getting too far ahead. So, what you see on the map of the United States here in Canada is this is the EdMaps uh, distribution. This is voluntary reporting data on a county basis here. All the green um, being counties in which Phragmites, uh, the, the the European version or the the non-native version, being reported. And what you can see is an incredible abundance uh, covering almost the entire United States. Um, there's a bit of a lag in the southeastern United States uh, regarding, uh, you know, reporting. I suspect if we really got honest, we could probably find some Phragmites in quite a few of those southern counties. But in general, you clearly see there's a strong northern and western distribution of reporting. And then, of course, along the Gulf Coast um, as, as sort of the other hot spot. And that's going to come into play here a little bit. Um, habitat wise, this is a plant, you know, in terms of wetlands, uh, everything from wet ditches on roadsides, uh, inundations, uh, just give it a little bit of water in a wet spot and you'll get Phragmites. Um, you know, this is a major problematic across so much of the northeastern United States, uh, but, it, but it doesn't stop there across the western U.S. from Utah, um, sort of being one of the hot spots. And in the invasion of both brackish systems all the way into freshwater systems. So Phragmites sort of 
seems like it's got almost no limits. Uh, now, I know we, we does have limits, especially on the salinity side, but the bottom line is it's a plant in wetland habitats across the country um, that is an incredibly diverse uh, systems, uh, wetland systems. <laughs> now, a big question that always comes up is, okay, I've been hearing a lot about this whole issues of, of Phragmites, different uh, species or haplotypes and, you know, what's going on here. And basically what we're looking at now would be um, following the work of Kristen Saltonstall, um, Phragmites australis being common reed there at the top. We've got a second one, which is the American or uh, version American common reed, which is a subspecies Americanus, uh, which is extremely common across the Northern tier states. And then Australis subspecies uh, Berlandieri, uh, which is the sort of Gulf Coast uh, version of this. Now, we do also have some hybrids. So we have identified Americanus uh, uh, subspecies uh, by Australis. And so there is this reality of hybrids coming into play. Now, over the last 20 years, a lot of folks have spent a lot of time being confused about Phragmites identification. And when we look at distributions, it doesn't help a lot and common names don't help either. You see that the native Phragmites, the subspecies Americanus on the left in green there, as, uh, as having a, a very wide uh, distribution across the U.S., uh, across all the north, though, with the exception of the southeastern part. We also see the Gulf Coast Phragmites, which is definitely um, in the, from Mexico, Central America, and, and southern tier there along the Gulf Coast. Well, that's also native, too, so there's some confusion there. Yeah, it's, it's native, but we call it Gulf Coast Phragmites. And then we have the introduced, the Australis, which uh, is present across every single state now, uh, basically. So maps like this, you can see tremendous overlap, of course, uh, given that the, the non-native uh, or introduced is uh, spread across uh, all 50 states uh, with the native and the Gulf Coast Phragmites there intermingling in areas. The issues of hybridization are, are going to confound this and make it even more complex uh, over the next few uh, decades, especially. <clears throat> The, the, the diagnostic characteristics associated with teasing these things apart, according to Saltonstall and company, have had to do with ligule length and uh, the glooms. So we're talking about a morphological characteristic in the ligule there, uh, where the leaf uh, sheaths attach, and then the actual within the inflorescences on the glooms, uh, you know, associated with the individual um, spikelets. And so she's basically broken these out. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into a taxonomic diatribe here on these things, but in general, dealing with ligule links requires a hand lens, at least a dissecting scope, the same thing for measuring gloom links. And so these are, are very minute differences. Now for land managers, um, 20 years ago, Bern Blossie at, at Cornell was really trying to come up with some more visual and morphological things that land managers could really grasp hold of easily without getting into the taxonomic world. And so he, he sort of came up with some characteristics that the native leaves, when they dry, tend to really detach from the stems easily, whereas the introduced Phragmites were really rigid and tight and stayed on the dead stems. There's lots of ideas about growth form and plant density, suggesting the introduced is always denser stands, more aggressive, more dense growth, fewer other species growing in them. You know, those are relative. It's, it's, it's obvious in a lot of cases, but if you have a new infestation, that's not, not always gonna be there. Things like comb texture and color. I hate using colors uh, for this type of identification. The same thing with spots on the combs. But, uh, but in general, you know, some of the, the, the morphological sort of view, um, sort of M things to key in on, you know, included things like a lighter green leaf color versus the much darker green and broader leaves for the uh, introduced. So, you know, these types of, of, of guides um, can be useful. Um, they can be a little frustrating though. And if you truly want to know, do I have the non-native, there are two labs in the U.S. currently offering genetic testing that I can share with you. There may be others, but uh, uh, Doug Wendell's lab at Oakland University and Karen Mock's lab at Utah State University. So I've provided contact information for uh, both of these labs if you really, really, really need uh, to get an absolute genetic test done for any of your Phragmites populations. Or I'll reach out to them regarding costs. Uh, I don't have that listed here, 
Doug also indicated to me that he does a preliminary screen for hybrids. Uh, so if you feel like kind of what you're dealing with is somewhere in between the native Phragmites and clearly and not the introduced, that it may be potentially a hybrid. And he has a, some, an initial screen he can do for that too. So I have just been in contact with both of these labs here in the last 24 hours, and both are offering the service of testing. So I wanna make that information available to you. Okay, moving on here. Now, you know, the reality is here, we're all here because we face stands of Phragmites that look something like this, very dense, monotypic growth, uh, very high stem densities. Um, we know the impacts <clears throat> and we know the struggles that we face in terms of reducing native plant diversity, the trouble it causes in marshes, um, messing with water flow, you name it, um, along rights of ways. I mean, this is, the problems go on and on for a classic invasive plant in terms of the, the problems it causes. Now, Phragmites has been argued to be have some habitat values. It's definitely a strong soil stabilizer. Um, you know, and some people have touted that as a benefit, uh, providing cover for some wildlife. But in general, you know, when we have seen this plant explode on such aggressive uh, ways, covering thousands of acres in dense monotypic stands, um, you know, we have pretty good evidence there that, that we have a significant invasive plant problem at that point. So the reality is there's plenty of good data out there suggesting the, the negative impacts for Phragmites. And, um, and so we can relate to these pretty easily. <laughs> if we step back a little bit on the big picture and think about some of the features of Phragmites, you know, this is an emergent plant, okay? So it's kind of a facultative wetland species, often very strongly associated with water, but tolerating some slightly more upland conditions in a lot of cases too. In this case, uh, it's clearly got the leaf and flower traits gonna be similar to upland grasses. So we've got a nice waxy cuticle uh, on the leaves with very upright growth, uh, which is very characteristic of a lot of upland grasses but it also possesses the hollow stems with the arenchyma tissue for gas exchange. So the bottom line is it's capable of tolerating the submersed, uh, the inundated environment uh, for a long periods of time based upon its ability to snorkel and, um, and take oxygen down to the roots and rhizomes. It's a really impressive plant from that perspective. The physiology of the snorkeling is amazing. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that today. Um, but it's kind of a who's who in the ecophysiology world based upon what it's capable of doing. And finally, its roots and rhizomes clearly are anchored in the substrate. We're going to get into a lot more discussion on the rhizomes because they truly are the, the heart of the problem. Um, we know its tolerance of flooding. So we know it's a plant that's capable of seasonal uh, tolerance of seasonal high water. We also know it's very tolerant of, of seasonal low water conditions. And so, you know, its tolerance of a extremely varied uh, you know, hydrologic environment coupled with its aggressive growth, you know, sort of put it in a category that rises often above a lot of native plants within the emergent communities that may be more stress tolerators in the saline environments um, that just don't quite have the competitive uh, growth and, and, and biomass allocation and even photosynthetic capacity that Phragmites has. I also couple that with a lack of natural enemies for the introduced Phragmites. And you know, the invasion hypotheses really begin to pile up here <laughs> as, as being, yeah, uh, that's one more uh, thing that Phragmites does uh, to cause trouble and why it's invasive. Um, tolerant of brackish conditions too. You can't overemphasize this enough that, um, that it definitely has, you know, makes its way down into plenty of brackish conditions. All right, so running through a few basic biology features here. Now, when you get in the literature, you're gonna find statements all over the place about Phragmites and sexual reproduction or the ability to make seed. The reality is it's partially self-incompatible. And we often have had reports of very low seed fill and very low seed viability from so many stands and many studies where they just didn't see a lot of viable seed being produced. So I like to say there, and there are studies out there that are now showing quite a bit of seed viability in certain cases. Overall, it's wildly variable, but frequently low in a lot of cases. So those showy blooms or inflorescences we see with Phragmites, a lot of times it's kind of faking it and they're not producing a whole lot of viable seed, but you can't write it off completely, all right? <clears throat> seed are also generally short-lived. This doesn't have a long-lived persistent seed bank uh, like a lot of legumes may have. Um, 
And that's a good thing. And that's going to be helpful for us. It is dispersed by just about everything. Okay. Yes. Anthropogenic means, of course, but water uh, seeds will float for many, many days. Um, waterfowl and so forth are assisting in the movement of seed or prop, you know, viable seed uh, from place to place, especially down watersheds. Now, germination wise, the seed clearly germinate on moist substrate very nicely, but there's good data out there to indicate these things aren't germinating at significant water depths. And so usually I think the maximum emerge has, has been a, uh, about five centimeters that they've seen a, emergence of Phragmites or germination and subsequent emergence and, and no more than about five centimeters of water. Most of the time seeing almost none with any inundation whatsoever. So it's a species that's going to be primed for germination, ready to go uh, as water is drawn down. Um, and you often, if you do see seedlings, you may get that ring of seedling effect um, as water uh, slightly declines leaving that bare moist substrate. <laughs> seed to flowering or seed to seed, we like to say with Phragmites, it can occur in about two to four years to be in the short end. So typically for new seedlings, you should not see them flowering that first year. Sometimes not the second year, depending upon the environment. And sometimes in more stressful environments that may take up to four years. So the reality is, yeah, it's it's got a relatively short juvenile phase. Um, certainly a little bit longer than a lot of our rural type species, um, but again, it's not that long. And so it falls in line with a number of other grasses, um, you know, perennial, perennial grasses in general, taking at least a couple of years to begin to really well establish before kicking into sexual reproduction. All right, so what does all this mean for management, okay? Um, here's a reality, older large clonal stands. Uh, genetic variability in them is often extremely low. If self-incompatibility is really a major issue, then you're not going to get a lot of seed production in really old, well-established clonal stands that have low genetic variation and um, don't have a lot of independent, unique individuals. Uh, so in this case, a lot of those really scary, massive monotypic stands of Phragmites may actually not be producing a whole lot of seed. Um, so that could be a, that's a good thing. If you've got a lot of small patches popping up, especially out, you know, beyond the larger infestations, there's potentially a lot more chances for seed production from those because you may have genetically distinct individuals so that um, self-incompatibility is not going to be an issue at all. And uh, there's better, much better chances of producing viable seed in those situations from small patches, unique genetic individuals. Now, good news is we're not battling along with seed banks, I said, but the reality is, and you know this well, it's a numbers game, okay, on dispersal and probability of recruitment from seed. So if you're making a billion seed on an acre basis, you know, even 0.1%, that's a ton of individuals um, that are surviving in that case. So I always caution people to be wary, be, be a little bit suspicious of seed um, percentages in terms of viability germination, because when you're pumping out that many, even a very small percentage is enough to be extremely invasive. Okay. And finally, hybridization has got a, got a real opportunity to change this whole equation, resulting in a whole lot more potentially viable seed um, as more and more genetic recombination occurs. And we've seen this with other self-incompatible species. I think Russian knapweed in the West is a really good example of this, um, where we saw very limited Russian knapweed in small patches that just sort of sat there for a long time, but it hit a point where it sort of overcame the bottleneck and began to successfully outcross and boom, the populations really exploded. All right, so one reality, check on seed, given the late summer flowering, and a limit of Phragmites with a limited window of establishment, you know, in the fall, in a lot of cases with, with uh, cold weather and frost coming in, especially across the northern tier states, Bible seeds are most likely to germinate in disturbed areas or on bare substrate the following spring. So that's going to often be a window. And I'm going to ask you the question, how many folks are looking for viable seed, seedlings germinating and seed germination in Phragmites management programs? Okay, think about that. Look for them in the spring. Look for you're not going to see them in the middle of dense Phragmites patches, but pay attention. Um, and, uh, and if you are beginning to see a lot of seedlings, then, then this is a fundamental reality that you're going to have to face within management. Okay. But a lot of folks may not still have much seed production. And in that case, the focusing on more of the asexual components, including prevention, can come in uh, with avoiding seed spread. Uh, if it's high, 
So don't mow through it late in, you know, after seed production or drive through it. Timing treatments to prevent seed production. And you'll read that in just about every extension bulletin on Phragmites to get treatments out before seed production. And subsequent following um, follow-up treatments being timed to deal with new seedling flushes before they become well-established. With new seedlings, given they don't tolerate, they don't germinate under water really, and don't tolerate a lot of heavy inundation early, can hydrology be manipulated? Now, if you have, if you have the power to manipulate hydrology, you're probably already doing it and can testify to where it's effective. Um, we know in coastal areas of restoration of brackish systems has been one successful way uh, of, of ma managing Phragmites. Um, and in general, being able to hold water at higher levels at certain times of the year can also be helpful. All right, so moving on, Phragmites rhizomes. And I like to say getting to the root of the problem, it's getting to the rhizome of the problem. These are underground, underground creeping stems. And um, we have, I'm not going to say they're morphologically totally different, but boy, they sure look different. Um, oftentimes on the upland transition, you'll see big, big rhizomes, very long, thick with limited branching, especially in that upland transition. And, as, and that's that top right picture. If you look at the bottom lower picture, it's often much more common, especially in wet areas where you'll have much more slender rhizomes, often about a centimeter in diameter and, and up. Uh, one to two centimeters really um, that are very, very frequently branched with lots of fine roots coming off of them. Um, so, you know, you will see a lot of variation among patches in regards to the rhizome profile and distribution. And a lot of that can be somewhat hydrology driven. Um, but, uh, but in general, you are going to find a lot of rhizomes underneath the patch of Phragmites. The rhizomes themselves, these are units of reproduction asexually, so these rhizome pieces can sprout uh, from the nodes. There's a tremendous amount of gas in the tank or energy storage within those inner nodes of the rhizomes. And so if you think about human-mediated disturbance of, of so many different kinds, we have moved rhizome fragments all over the place um, in so many different ways. And so Anthropogenic media dispersal, very common, but also natural flash flood events, uh, scouring events uh, have, have moved lots and lots of rhizomes. Um, we know that for a fact. The local patch expansion is almost always rhizome driven. So as you see um, a patch of a circular patch of Phragmites expanding radially outward, that's almost always rhizome expansion. So that's asexual reproduction and has been the driver and the observation of just about every Phragmites researcher in the country um, as, as rhizome expansion driving invasion, okay? Locally, especially. Complete kill is extremely difficult to these rhizomes. There's no question. A big issue is the sheer amount of rhizome biomass below ground uh, in relation to above ground. We think about the massive amounts of above ground biomass, but there's a heck of a lot of tonnage of Phragmites rhizomes below ground too. And oftentimes it's difficult to get enough herbicide into the plant um, to successfully translocate to this massive network of rhizomes, which is why we almost always see incomplete control with an initial intervention. All right, a question has come up, how deep do Phragmites rhizomes go? So what I've got here is a couple of different pictures of Phragmites stands on the left. You can see um, Phragmites rhizomes, they're, they're forming a very distinct layer there of about 12 inches or 30 centimeters. Uh, the picture on the right, what you can see there is a much more distressing um, <laughs> depth and, uh, and uh, distribution of massive, massive rhizomes going down about 24 inches within that picture on the right. Um, and, you know, so the reality is they go pretty deep. Uh, you know, people have questioned, well, do they make it all the way to the center of the earth? Jules Verne did not report on Phragmites rhizomes um, in that book. But the bottom line is um, it's contentious. And I can't really tell you there's an absolute average depth for rhizomes, but I'd like to say 8 to 24 inches is probably a pretty fair shot um, across a lot of uh, systems. Um, you'll see a massive concentration of rhizomes in the top eight to 12 inches, but uh, as the, with the picture we just saw, um, they can often be massively concentrated even deeper. Now, there are several good reports, legitimate reports of rhizome growth below six feet um, or 180 centimeters. And in Nebraska on, on the, uh, the Platte River, the North Platte, there have been rhizomes reported to be as deep as 30 feet. 
Okay. I suspect those are anecdotal reports likely buried in sediment deposition events. And so we know in river systems like that, that massive flood events can result in massive deposition. And so what it demonstrates to me is that Phragmites has the energy reserves to push through a heck of a lot of feet of soil in those situations. Um, so the reality is, yes, there are, there's, there's a lot of variation in Phragmites depth. Rhizomes are also deeply buried by heavy equipment, especially along roads and ditches. And this is one of the places that we tend to see them deeper where excavation has put them deeper. True roots actually go much deeper than rhizomes, of course, but they absolutely do not produce new shoots. So differentiating root from rhizome tissue is very important in any conversation about what you're dealing with below ground. So the roots are, the, are much finer, uh, very fibrous, uh, important for nutrient and water uptake, whereas the rhizomes uh, are creeping stems responsible for patch expansion. Now, it's not just below the below ground. We've got it above ground, too, with stolons, okay? So above ground creeping stems and shoot sprouting, for that matter. So if you sever these uh, above ground stems, throw it out in the water, what's going to happen? They will often frequently root and, um, and, and sprout. And if they find a substrate to establish on, uh, they will establish new populations. So we can have these long running stolons above ground, and you can see that um, it's literally putting out uh, new shoots every, uh, every few inches. Um, the stolen internode links are highly variable depending upon the environment, but in this case, you can see that uh, they're often like even, they can be up to six to 12 inches. So that's, that's really impressive, and, um, but also very frustrating from a management perspective as these stolons um, can be troubling, often not really even uh, receiving a whole lot of good herbicide coverage and not getting complete kill, especially when you have dormant buds along those stolons. Now, I said the plant is loaded with energy, okay? So the rhizomes and the stolons can actually have considerable energy reserves. This is kind of a generalized model, and you may have seen something like this, where we've got a pattern of energy uh, depletion and storage occurring within Phragmites. And it looks often something like this. The data suggests some a bit of variation here, but the general pattern would be um, high energy reserves um, by late uh, fall into the winter, uh, utilized for storage over overwintering, and then subsequent uh, flushes of new growth. You can see in March, April, May, all the way into June, those uh, energy reserves are declining and they don't go to zero, okay? They never go to zero, but they do decline and that's when it's allocating stored energy into the new stem and shoot and leaf growth in this early spring. By typically by late spring, or early summer, it sort of hits some sort of minimal and then it begins to recover after full leaf expansion. Uh, the plant uh, begins to both recharge the rhizomes and it also begins to enter into its sexual reproductive phase. And that's why we see flowering typically in that July, August into September. And which is why we're often stressing management um, targeting, you know, ideally um, towards, uh, towards the lowest parts of the carbohydrate depletion, but prior to flowering and sexual reproduction. So that's why we often are stressing uh, management interventions there during the mid, by midsummer um, into the, to the early fall. What rhizomes mean for management, okay? In almost every phragmite situation, they are absolutely gonna be the target for control. And the reality is the research on complete eradication or elimination of all rhizomes is extremely scarce. And so the data telling you how to do this is, is essentially non-existent for the most part. What we tend to say is it's gonna take several years of intensive treatment, but a lot of y'all are finding that a single intervention uh, on an annual calendar basis is just not doing it. The out of sight, out of mind aspect absolutely has to be overcome regarding Phragmites and rhizomes. And evaluations of control based upon top growth removal um, that is very short uh, and, and, and essentially it's a very short uh, way to approach it. And so you've got to look below ground because we can see all kinds of treatments that will take the top growth out, but we always see rapid regrowth from the rhizomes if we're not dealing with them. And I'm going to tell you this right now, be cautious of anybody proposing management of Phragmites that's not willing to have an honest conversation about their treatment effectiveness on rhizomes. All right, if people won't come to the table, 
to talk about how effective their strategy is on dealing with rhizomes, then you need to be a little very cautious and even a little suspicious um, because don't get don't buy in don't get taken by the snake oil salesman telling you they're going to have fantastic control if they are not willing to tell you how effective it is on killing the rhizomes of phragmites okay let's jump in to some questions all right that every natural resource manager has got to be asking about phragmites now this is not exhaustive again but it begins to integrate a lot of these concepts on the basic biology that i've been talking about with the actual tools of management. And if you, if you disagree with anything I'm saying here on management tools, throw it in the chat box. If you say something, hey, this is working great for us, I wanna hear about it. Because I'm synthesizing you know, across a, a pretty vast body of literature and experience here for different things. And independent sites can often manifest some pretty unique and successful control of a lot of invasive species that the general population may not be aware of. So if you've come up with something that's really dynamic and spectacular, make sure we are discussing it today, okay? And the first thing that I've got to lay out here is really expectations, okay? So are, ask yourself the question, are my expectations for Phragmites management realistic? Are they clearly defined? And I know that we all have natural resource management uh, plans written? Have we defined Phragmites management clearly? Is Do we have some sort of measurable ideas about it? Or are we thinking about it from a long-term multi-year perspective? We know from studies that Phragmites management is a commitment. It's not a single treatment. It's not an annual thing. It's going to take several years. Is my expectations, do they go beyond reducing Phragmites abundance? Am I thinking about native plants? Am I thinking about the community and the ecosystem uh, that I want there? Am I taking measurements or am I looking towards getting it on a trajectory that's getting me where I want to go? Am I unrealistically set on eradication? Am I dealing with 10,000 acres of Phragmites thinking I'm going to eradicate it and disappointed when I don't? The fundamental reality is sometimes you've really got to gauge and regauge expectations on what is possible for Phragmites management based upon the amount of resources that you have available to deal with the problem. It's not a cheap problem. The environment it grows in makes it even more expensive, which kicks it up a notch. And with the supply chain issues we're having these days with herbicides and, and fuel costs and, and, and in general, an employee or contractor uh, costs, uh, the reality is invasive plant control is getting more and more expensive by the day. All right. <clears throat> now, I'm going to ask you a question, and this may offend some of you, but I think it's an honest question that's got to be asked, and some of you will commiserate with me immediately. How well do I know my contractor if I'm if I'm uh, doing a contracting or you know with a, with for invasive plant work on my installation? How well do I know the applicators are using? I got to tell you, in my experience working across Florida and several other installations across the U.S., vegetation management contractors are not the same. There is incredible variation in the companies that do veg work. So you may have companies that are exclusively invasive plant management focused. You may have companies that primarily deal in forestry weed control or right-of-way weed control where the mentality of suppression is not the same as it is for invasive plant management. I've also run into situations where, say, a big civil engineering uh, contractor literally had the veg management contract, and what did they do? They subbed it out to a local lawn care company, okay? I'm not busting on that lawn care company, but what I'm saying is you can run into situations where there is incredible variation within the mindset of the contractors and applicators that you have working on your installations. And you got to get to know these folks and you got to understand their perspective and where they're coming from and recognize that um, if, if they are coming in with a very specific mindset of, a, of vegetation suppression from silvicultural operations, that is not the mindset that we often want to embrace in terms of invasive plant control, okay? I'm not telling you to kill the contract or anything like that, but I'm just, or ditch the contract, but I'm saying recognize there's a lot of variation out there. Contractors these days are struggling to keep employees. They're struggling to hire good applicators and keep them. 
It is a major, major issue in a lot of areas right now. And there's tremendous turnover within the applicator community as folks come and go through applicator jobs very, very quickly in a lot of cases. So getting those traditional applicator crews where you had guys who'd been doing this for 20 or 30 years who were really seasoned and really knew the minutia of how to make good applications. A lot of those folks have moved on and we're in this constant turnover of new people who are learning this for the first time in a lot of cases every couple of years. That's a big issue for invasive plant management and the mistakes that are made from that are exponential. Yes, I'm going from preaching to meddling here and I apologize if you think so, but not really. Okay, and again, here's a classic example. You know, look at the drift, look at the, uh, you know, spray gun, look at the lack of PPE in the pictures here. I mean, you name it, uh, you're gonna be dealing with all kinds of situations like that. <clears throat> all right, next thing, and this is something I've run into a lot too, is contractual language hindering the Phragmites management process or progress, okay? I've seen rapid brownout expectations in contracts of expected brownout within seven days, okay? Um, that's, that's, that's really, really difficult with glyphosate and imazapyr. I've seen expectations of pre or post treatment mowing that were completely unrealistic for successful Phragmites management. Now I know maximum, maximum vegetation height comes into play big time in a lot of situations, especially along runways and a lot of military installations, it's critical, but you got to be aware that successful invasive plant management has got to have some caveats on max vegetation management height, or you're just going to have to plan to repeatedly mow it on a, on a you know, weekly, every uh, monthly basis. I've seen contracts with herbicide requirements that are too strict, and I've seen them with requirements that were way too lax that allowed contractors to do ridiculous things like tank mix, contact herbicides like Diquat, uh, you know, with glyphosate on tough to control perennials like Phragmites. So look closely with at the contract language and make sure that you are not binding the contractor to completely unrealistic or uns expectations resulting in unsuccessful control based upon that language. Now, another thing that I have seen across military installations, and you have to ask yourself this question, am I disconnected from Phragmites management tools and techniques that are being used by the contractor? And it all comes down to that picture right there. And what is that? It's called too many irons in the fire. Okay. Now I'm probably dating myself with that expression a little bit, um, being Gen X, born in 1972. Uh, but the bottom line is I see natural resource managers overworked with a ton of responsibility that goes well beyond invasive plant management. It typically averages about 30% of the job for a lot of folks. So they, they are already focusing 70, at least 70% of their time on other natural resource management issues. They got a lack of time, maybe a lack of experience or expertise when they're sort of come into a position and are assigned invasive plant management responsibilities. Maybe they're coming from a wildlife background and just didn't get the training on it. So, you know, with a lack of communication, especially with the contractors, the bottom line is this is post-management frustration extraordinaire. And I have seen this over and over and over. I encourage you with Phragmites, you have got to lean into it. You've got to lean into understanding the plant, understanding the techniques, and understanding the contractors if they're the ones doing the work for you so that we can get beyond this repeated pattern of post-management frustration and failure that we see over and over with Phragmites. Is it a multi-year treatment, post-treatment monitoring? Is it in there? Is it in the contract? Um, are you doing it? Is it a brief visual inspection where you drive by and slow down to at least 45 miles an hour to take a look at what happened? Or are you actually able to get out there and do some intensive vegetation monitoring? That on the right is much more costly and labor intensive. If nothing else, for gosh sakes, at least do some follow-ups to get out there and see how effective the treatments are and what is coming back, okay? Now, do you write this into your contracts or is it on you to do this? And this is a big thing. It increases the cost of control when you stick it into the contract for sure. But the bottom line is, if you're in a situation where you have zero time for monitoring, absolutely none whatsoever, it is important that somebody's out there doing it. And if you have to write it into the contract to at least get a little bit of monitoring into it, then by gosh, do it because it will pay off in the long run. All right. 
<clears throat> and here's why. You need to know Phragmites is always going to come back on some level. So you've got to know where it's coming back from. Is, are you dealing with seedlings? Are you dealing with stolen recovery? Or is it all from rhizomes that are simply not being killed with the treatment approach you're making? Okay, I'm um, sorry about that. <clears throat> if you, a shovel is the best friend for monitoring. Okay, if you find firm whitish rhizomes after any treatment whatsoever, you still have Phragmites. Okay, these things die extremely slowly, even after Amazapir treatments, they can take six months to die. So bottom line is some post-treatment monitoring with a shovel can really clue you in as to the efficacy of the treatments longer term, um, especially, uh, um, oh, in, in, you know, in, in every environment you can do it in, but especially during the dry season when you can better more easily access sites. The, the, the lady in this picture has got three shovels out there, okay? I've got them all three circled. You might break two of them in the process, but by gosh, get out there with a shovel and really begin to dig in and understand the extent of the rhizome problem and whether or not your treatment strategies are negatively impacting that. Are you, is after every treatment you're seeing fewer and fewer rhizomes, that's a good thing. If you're not seeing any decrease in abundance, then you are basically just holding the line of that. Dr. Inlow. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, so there's a question in the comment section. Do you want me to hold those for later or do you want me to just make you um, aware? Let, let's hold those for later. So, I, look, okay. it, I mean, I definitely want to get to them for sure. So let's just hold that for later. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, are you dealing with monotypic or multi-acre stands uh, or spot, small spot infestations? Here's a nice aerial, um, you know, that's got some nice little circular patches, some broader patches there. This can really come into play, especially in terms of allocation of resources. We advocate strongly for attacking the small patches um, where we believe that uh, we can be much more successful at eradicating the small patches and sort of holding the line and beating back the larger patches. What we know the worst thing you can possibly do is wait out into the middle or partially treat larger patches. That's where we have seen uh, long-term treatment failure uh, over and over and over in, in partial or limited treatments. And so we need to be very aware of that, and, and especially when we have limited resources to allocate. <laughs> now, a lot of ecologists who have dug into this have really taken it to the level of the watershed and are strongly advocating for much larger scale mindsets on Phragmites. These often are going to cross tremendous uh, political uh, lines, property lines, boundaries. Um, you know, so oftentimes the intense Phragmites you're dealing with may be a small chunk of a much larger problem on a bigger watershed, or you might be the source population for others. So understanding the watershed that you're working within with Phragmites is really important. You may not be able to do anything about it, but at least having some knowledge and understanding of what's upstream, what's coming downstream towards you, or what you're sending downstream uh, can actually really, really uh inform uh, potential recovery. <laughs> we all want restoration. We're all managing for some target native plant community, depending upon the wetland systems you're working within. What kind of trajectory is feasible for you? Okay, restoration is very expensive. Buying native plants, buying plugs, even buying seed, these are all very costly. Well, uh, there's a lot of good seed bank research out there suggesting that a lot of the wetlands, even invaded by Phragmites, still do have relatively intact native seed banks. And so a lot of times it's simply a matter of getting Phragmites under control um, and allowing the seed banks to release to get a lot of native species coming back. So oftentimes, you know, you may be dealing with mixed stands of Phragmites and native at that point, um, but the fundamental reality is um, that's part of the process and it complicates things, but it, but it is what it is. Or do you have other invasives coming in? Do you have purple loose strife? Um, you know, do you have other troublesome invaders? Do you have, uh, you know, phalaris or things like that? So knowing and understanding kind of really what can I do restoration wise? What do I see occurring in terms of passive restoration? Is that sort of getting me on the right trajectory? Is that going to be enough? Um, and hopefully it is, and, and in a lot of wetlands, it can be enough um, because, again, you can't have native seed banks that are sort of hanging in there. 
Okay, let's get into the tools. What are non-chemical approaches going to work? Okay, so yes, we know it's a glyphosate amazapir game for the most part, but we use a lot of other tools in the, in the marsh. Um, and the reality is a lot of these need to be integrated in order to have any meaningful success. We have a lot of marsh masters out there chewing up a lot of Phragmites. We have rollers that are out there functioning. So the reality is physical controls. As standalone tools, things such as fire, cutting, rolling, grazing, they can temporarily reduce Phragmites stem densities. They can break, break it up. They can actually facilitate native plant recruitment. They do this in a lot of really good, clear ways, reducing standing biomass and cutting out the shading. So those are good, okay? Facilitating the decomposition of the Phragmites uh, leaves and stems. So by chopping them up, by mowing, breaking those things down, we can expose substrate, we can, we can warm the soil and increase uh, the sunlight and actually get a lot of enhanced germination and growth of native plants. So there's some good things that are happening there with physical controls. They are costly. Um, cost per acre on a lot of physical controls can run hundreds into the thousands of dollars per acre. We know that. Uh, the fundamental reality is it's just expensive to do this kind of work. We also know that flooding has tremendous utility for Phragmites beyond these other physical measures. Raising salinity in brackish conditions has been very successful at restoration of a lot of, um, in a lot of uh, brackish conditions or brackish marshes <clears throat> along the coast. We know that um, flooding can inhibit seed germination, seedling growth, and even resprouting. I'll get into that a little bit. But we also know that flooding is not a quick fix but it's occurring over time. You know, it's a process that can occur over time. And so we can't apply a very short-term flooding treatment expecting it to have really long-term uh, consequences against Phragmites. So it's, it's a great thing. I know there's a lot of science regarding hydrologic restoration of Phragmites. That's something I don't have a lot of time to spend on today. If you know about it, you're probably already doing it and have done it everywhere you can because a lot of times um, that's where some of the best success stories for Phragmites restoration have occurred. Now, I want to address this issue of depletion of rhizome carbohydrates. I showed you that generalized model. And, um, you know, you may have seen this uh, in, a, in, a, in a graph before with the orange line there of repeatedly mowing a, a perennial plant to, de to deplete its carbohydrate reserves. Um, and you can see there that um, this is a theoretical line to drive it to zero. The fundamental reality is that's very generalized and theoretical, and it rarely happens that way. With what we see with Phragmites, we often are advocating for some sort of intervention there when carbohydrate reserves are the lowest and maybe just beginning to recharge also before flowering in the months of you know, June, July, August um, as being the prime time to go after Phragmites. The fundamental reality a lot of people are facing here, though, is single interventions on an annual basis aren't getting them the progress that they want to see. And so we may need to be rethinking this model, thinking about some earlier interventions in the, you know, into actually uh, earlier summer, even later spring, so that uh, the opportunity for a second intervention to regrowth within that calendar year may be necessary. What about cut to drown? How many folks have been hearing about cut to drown? It's a fascinating idea of cutting Phragmites stems below the water level, um, basically cutting off their ability to snorkel, cutting off their ability to get oxygen down to the roots and rhizomes with the idea that we are going to drown Phragmites roots and rhizomes and, uh, and sort of solve the problem that way. Uh, it's a great idea on paper. Um, you can see it generates a tremendous amount of cut material. Um, that you're going to have to deal with. A little bit on the concept of snorkeling here, the cut and drown strategy is all about uh, essentially cutting off gas exchange to the roots, getting oxygen uh, levels reduced. And, and what I would like to say about that is when you have a Phragmites plant growing here, um, if you cut above the mean water level, so if, you're, if your contractor is getting out there when the water is high, there's a good chance you may be cutting too high because as soon as that water level drops back down, those uh, underwater stems will be able to breathe again and they can reestablish that snorkeling effect. <laughs> Better cutting height is definitely below the mean water level. And some folks will tell you, you need to be cutting in the, in the mud um, as low as you possibly can uh, for effective control here. 
So remember that, remember that with contractors, especially if you're utilizing this technique, don't just cut shallowly above the high water level or it will result in failure. The other thing is one shot is not gonna do it and this can often need to occur over multiple years. The reality also is with cut and drown is all those cut stem pieces can re-sprout like crazy. And um, they have to be, they're often encouraged to be removed, you know, from the, the wetland environment where they can dry out, be piled and dry out. So there's significant expense in those types of physical removal of that type of material. What we need is an aquatic harvester for Phragmites that deals with all this above water biomass. Because as soon as we put it in the water, there is the potential for it to sprout. What about fire? Um, I love fire. I'm a bit of a pyromaniac myself. And, um, you know, with grasses, with invasive grasses, uh, you know, fire is often one of those things that, that makes people nervous. We know that we need to burn a lot of ecosystems we deal with are fire dependent on some level. And, um, and there are a lot of benefits associated with burning of removing a lot of that dead standing biomass and uh, creating conditions that are gonna be more favorable uh, for the, the germination and survival of a lot of native plants. Um, you know, so fire is a good thing. And um, it's often a first step associated with invasive plant management with Phragmites. Getting rid of all that dead biomass or dried down biomass is important. But know that um, just with a lot of other pyrogenic grasses, Phragmites is going to re-sprout very readily following fire. And you've got to follow up with, with additional interventions if you're going to have any success from that. What about herbivores? You'll see a lot of this comes out in the news very frequently. Somebody who's studying goats um, or cattle associated with Phragmites. Turns out it's a pretty high quality forage when it's, especially when it's young. Um, and that a lot of, uh, out in Utah, there's been a number of, of, of efforts of using grazing allotments uh, that are dealing with Phragmites infestations. They're not eradicating it, uh, but they definitely open up stands and create conditions associated uh, that are going to facilitate more diversity in the system. Now, the reality with any types of herbivores like this, especially along water, you know, you've got to have a lot of technical skill and detail associated with that. You've got to be able to have the fencing, you've got to be able to deal with, have nutrient mitigation, and you've got to be able to move the animals when necessary. And, um, and the big thing is paying for it. So, you know, if you've got it on grazing allotments on large scale, uh, that's definitely not a bad way to go in a lot of cases. If you're paying a buck a, a, buck a head a day per goat uh, and only getting them for a couple of weeks, uh, you can spend thousands of dollars for what would be the equivalent of a good lawn mowing. Um, so you've got to, you've really got to weigh carefully the util utilization of, of, of grazing animals, especially goats. Um, <laughs> because they can effectively take down the vegetation, but they are certainly not controlling the rhizomes, and they can be expensive with contractors. What about biocontrol? Everybody cross your fingers, hold your breath. Um, Burn Blossy uh, and company and a number of colleagues moved forward a couple of agents, uh, Arcanara, Jimapunka, Punka, and, and Nurica. Um, these are two Lepidoptera that are, are pretty cool insects that um, the larvae burrow mine within the stems of Phragmites, uh, yellowing and killing out the, the terminal meristems. Um, these have been submitted to the technical advisory group uh, who has recommended them for release. However, they are not yet approved by USDA APHIS. They have gone through host specificity testing at this point. Being To be approved by TAG, you would have to. There's been some controversy here. And what's interesting is sort of the Phragmites, um, a lot of ecologists who study Phragmites have been divided into a couple of camps on this issue with this, some very vocal opposition to the release of these for concerns for the native uh, Phragmites um, and additional concerns. Uh, but in general, uh, it's a waiting game at this point to see when USDA APHIS is going to bring this to the table and make a decision or ruling on the release, potential release of these two insects. So I would say don't hold your breath. Um, it may take a few years. They've been very slow on the approval of a number of biocontrol agents and seem like they're getting slower and slower in the process. Okay, herbicide wise, let's wrap this up with herbicides because we've sort of go through all these other physical removal techniques we, we, we see they have some place, uh, they have some benefits, they have many limitations. 
and most land managers often fall back to two herbicides, okay, glyphosate and amazapyr. All right, both are non-selective. So non-target concerns can be very real for both of these herbicides. Both have aquatic labels, which means they can be utilized on Phragmites growing in water. They don't even have to be applied during the dry season. You can apply it to Phragmites in standing water. Both are typically foliar applied. We know with glyphosate, you've kind of got some stem injection stuff you can play with. One has soil residual activity, that's a mazapir. I'll talk more about that. One is more effective, that's a mazapir. I'll talk more about that. But neither are silver bullets. And, um, and this is really interesting. Nine years ago, there was a nice article published in Estuaries and Coasts that was a review of about 285 land managers. And basically within that survey, they found um, they were spending about 4.6 million bucks a year on Phragmites management, 94% of land managers were using herbicide to treat a total of 80,000 hectares. And despite the expenditures, the survey found that few organizations were accomplishing their management objectives, okay? So what they found was tremendous frustration with intensive herbicide use as being the most effective tool and still coming up short on Phragmites alone. Now, there's some reality to that, and it's and a lot of it is that yes, these herbicides aren't a silver bullet. So let's talk about these two options and kind of what they mean. The first is glyphosate, that's the active ingredient. Okay, um, you may know it as Roundup Custom. Rodeo was the uh, the first version of glyphosate where they took uh, the surfactants out. Now there are several generics that are also approved for aquatic use. Typically, a broadcast rate is about 3.75 quarts or 120 ounces per acre. Um, the reality is, if you're doing aerial applications, yeah, you, you know, you may think about this from a broadcast rate, but for most Phragmites land managers, we're often thinking about running this from a handgun, spray gun on a Marshmaster or something like that. So we're talking spot treatment concentrations in a lot of cases. The challenge here has to do with application volumes. With glyphosate, you know, the labels are gonna tell you somewhere between a three quarters to 2% for high volume applications. And by that, we mean 100 gallons per acre, uh, four to 7% or somewhere, you know, maybe five to 10% even for low volume applications um, without actually defining what they mean by low volume applications. And in aquatics, uh, typically a max label rate being 120 ounces for some products. Uh, so, you know, these treatments will burn down or take down the top growth completely, will provide some damage to the rhizomes, but you will find a single application on an annual basis is not gonna put you on a really good negative trajectory um, on a lot of Phragmites stands where it's just not simply enough to kill enough of the rhizomes. So it's, it's, it's the, the option that a lot of people lean towards because they're nervous about the second option, which is a Mazapir, okay? That's Habitat, uh, also known, you know, that's the aquatic version, Arsenal, uh, the forestry version that does have an aquatic label, generics like Polaris, uh, Echo Mazapir, other things like that. Typically, we see we're looking at a broadcast rate of about two to three quarts per acre, 64 to 96 ounces per acre. For spot treatments, what you're going to see on the labels is going to be a statement that says something like, you can mix this at the concentration you want, just don't apply more than 96 ounces per acre. And so what I like to say is about three quarters of a percent is the absolute starting point for Phragmites spot treatments with a Mazapir. A lot of folks are gonna be up in the one and a half percent on a volume to volume basis. For work I've done, I've been, I've been <laughs> you get more satisfied with higher concentrations and even up to a 2% concentration, which is a pretty hot concentration of imazapir. It's not a silver bullet again, but again, we are trying to deal with a massive amount of rhizomes and imazapir translocates exceedingly well uh, into the rhizomes of invasive grasses. You'll see that I had Cethoxidem and Fluazifop on there. I've kind of marked these off. If you are using either of these graminicides successfully for Phragmites, please reach out to me because my experience has been very limited efficacy on Phragmites with these. I've seen both do very weird things to them, but I've not seen significant long-term control. The bottom line is in dealing with spot treatment concentrations, keep the max label rate per acre in mind when setting spot treatment concentrations, okay? So 
And the labels can be vague on it, they can be frustrating, but you do have that max label rate per acre. And based upon your application volumes on spot, treat, on spot treatments, and that's, that's really the way to go. Figure that out and you can figure out what the maximum concentration you're gonna be comfortable at. All right, other glyphosate approaches, wiper type uh, approaches, you know, typically wiper applications are utilizing somewhere between a 33 and a 75% concentration. Um, those have been more useful for Johnson grass and, and other non-crop situations or pastures or stem injections. Um, anywhere from 100% uh, product uh, injected per stem, like five mils down to a 50% uh, concentration of the solution. And I've got a couple of pictures of it there from the Great Lakes uh, Phragmite site, uh, both cutting a stem and injecting. The fundamental reality is 1,500 stems. Um, you could find 1,500 stems in a little 10 by 10 patch um, in some cases. And so you're not gonna get a whole lot of coverage. You're putting a very concentrated amount of herbicide on a very small area and when utilizing these methods. So this is truly a small spot treatment type scenario. Okay, you may have heard that triclopyr actually has Phragmites on the label. So that'd be like Garlon 3A or Tricera. Both have aquatic labels. Additionally, a Mazamox herbicide, which is clear cast, actually has Phragmites on the label too. The question is, should I try these? The reality is the research shows they both have activity, which means that they will burn down the shoots. Triclopyr has demonstrated some short-term visual control about three months out on the shoots, not a whole lot of rhizome kill. And a Mazamox has kind of demonstrated, you know, similar things. And so we've seen that they have activity but we've not really figured out how to incorporate them into Phragmites management programs in a very meaningful way. And so you're not gonna see a lot of people using them. We've looked at a Mazamox in tank mixes with glyphosate and Amazapyr. It's not yielded viable results. And so the reality is there's probably a strong rate dependence for both of these with the higher rates where they go you know, to be more effective. They need more study. Clearly we need more tools in the toolbox but unfortunately, they're not two that I'm going to throw out there today and say, abandon glyphosate and amazapyr and go for triclopyr and clearcast. If you want to play with them, by all means, uh, you know, get out there and, and treat a few acres and, and, and evaluate them for yourselves. But I don't think that uh, they really have a really powerful fit long term. OK, a few more questions on herbicides that always come up. Does glyphosate or amazapyr kill seeds in the soil? Okay, so if we have Phragmites seed in the soil, is Amazapyr killing those? The answer is no. All right, Amazapyr herbicides don't absorb into dormant seeds or non-germinating seeds. They do absorb Amazapyr certainly in germinating seeds through the coleoptile and radical during the germination emergence process. This is where the soil residual activity of Amazapyr often brings more weed control to the table in getting the next flush of seedlings when they're germinating, if there's sufficient uh, herbicide in the soil at that time. But in general, glyphosate's not going to do that at all because it's strongly bound to soil particles. Does glyphosate and amazapyr kill Phragmites seed in the inflorescences? The answer here is yes, no, and maybe. All right, they can stop seed formation very early in the flowering process. And I'm talking about when those first flowers begin to push out, you know, from the combs, <clears throat> and they do nothing to mature seed that have yet to be released. So once a seed seed fill has occurred, um, these herbicides, are, that's no longer an active sink. And so they're not going to translocate to those seeds and then sort of be contained within the seeds to be active when uh, the seeds try to germinate. <clears throat> now, the problem here, again, <clears throat> is these very first um, spikes or spikelets, these very first spikelets that pop out, of that emerging seed head, they're going to mature a whole lot faster. So by the time you see a full-fledged inflorescence, you likely already have some mature seed down here, whereas these ones on the tip may yet to, yet to have fully matured. So once you get full inflorescences, you are getting very late in the game to have any shutdown on seed formation uh, for, those, uh, for those plants. All right, do rhizome, do herbicide treatments deplete rhizome energy reserves? The answer there is no. Um, following translocation, they're going to translocate and act according to their mode of action to directly kill living tissue. They don't, <clears throat> they don't sort of have some weird thing they're doing to carbohydrates. Surviving rhizomes will have high levels of carbohydrates, and we've seen that in studies. Sublethal herbicide quantities, 
that you're not putting enough, they can often inhibit rhizome sprouting. So basically the rhizome will sit there firm, white, and not dying and look like it's not ever gonna come up and you give it another six months, it forms buds, overcomes that sublethal dose of herbicide and grows on. We see this a lot. Uh, so we see a lot of sublethal suppression that, that gives you the perception of good weed control when it's actually just a delay in the whole process. <clears throat> Do herbicides translocate below the water line? This often comes up with torpedo grass in Florida with poor control being observed in really deep water conditions. I would love to get feedback from this group if they have observed better or worse control in treating Phragmites in deeper water conditions. We know that radioisotope studies suggest herbicides will translocate into roots and rhizomes, so yes, they will, uh, but still we can see poor control in deep water situations. All right, application timing for herbicides to wrap this up. Basically, look, you got to apply to actively growing, okay? So, uh, you know, this, this gives us a, an optimal timing after green up, after full leaf out. So, you know, late spring is the earliest typically. Anything delaying the onset of that new growth in the spring is going to push back uh, the timing a little bit. Um, but uh, we're trying to get these treatments out, targeting the lowest uh, when carbohydrates are the lowest or when they're actively moving carbohydrates to the rhizomes, you know, during, during that um, <clears throat> summer or the early fall period. So again, it's a wide window. Um, early frost can inhibit herbicide activity and sort of shut down the plant. So we want to be careful about treating too late in the fall and certainly too, too early in the spring. Application volumes, yeah, it can be important, but the reality is we can get ample coverage with aerial treatments at 20 gallons per acre. Backpacks, 30 to 60 is fine. And high volume handguns typically go out of 80 to 100 gallons per acre with spray to runoff. We use those because we're often spraying over the top of dense Phragmites patches, and it's difficult to get a lower application volume to get good coverage. And this is why we sort of fall into those high volume applications. We know, however, lower volumes actually provide a higher herbicide concentration in the droplet, and that actually can result in improved control. Trade-off is coverage in those dense infestations. Typically for uh, both herbicides need adjuvants, so one to four hours um, for rain fast, uh, for the most part for glyphosate and amazapyr. Lots of other adjuvants can be useful, non-ionic surfactants that are aquatic approved, same with methylated seed oils or D-limonene based, they're all good and, um, and can be very necessary when, when utilizing them with either of these aquatic herbicides. Um, other things like spray indicators can be useful for training your applicators, especially for spot treatments. And recognize with glyphosate, hard water conditions can definitely reduce glyphosate efficacy where water conditioning agents can be important. To finish up here, non-target damage is a concern with both. Spray drift, you saw pictures earlier of massive spray drift occurring, shooting those handguns way up in the air, and they can cause problems. The soil residual nature of a mazapir can impact many non-target species, but I'm here to tell you it's not a soil sterilant, okay? It's not gonna wipe everything out. Be cautious with it, but I would encourage you to lean into it, learn it, and refine it before rejecting a mazapir completely. As, as land managers, I think we need to learn how to use it better. And because, you know, with glyphosate, it is certainly a more effective product. And I think that we could probably make more ground leaning into a mazapir. Um, <clears throat> but do this cautiously and carefully, okay? If you don't understand or if you struggle to really uh, understand a lot more of the physiology of the herbicides, we will be offering in-depth herbicide mode of action webinars in the upcoming year. I'm laying that out there for you. I will make you aware of those through, you know, Armando uh, and Doug. Um, but uh, we want to do that for you for more in-depth training on this. All right, so to summarize and wrap this up, because I've gone longer than I wanted to. Phragmites management, it's going to cause you, you've got to lean in, you've got to engage more intensively than just about any other invasive plant management issue I've run into. At the end of the day, it is all about the rhizomes and dealing with that below ground growth. Monitoring and treatment follow-ups have to be part of the plan. Annual contracts that don't address this from year to year are going to struggle to, to really maintain progress. And so we need to deal with this on much longer term bases. Also, I would encourage you to follow up with USDA APHIS inquiring on the status of the biocontrols. 
I am a huge herbicide guy, but I'm a, as just as big of an advocate for biocontrol and where we have safe and effective selective biocontrol agents, we definitely need them. We need every tool in the toolbox. And, um, and so reach out to USDA and uh, see if we can uh, sort of <laughs> continuously follow up with them and see if we can move those biocontrols along if they deem them to be accepted. So with that, I wanna stop, take any questions. I'll be happy to stay here uh, as long as we have to to answer questions. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, this, so this is Armando. If you, if you please use the the hand up uh, icon at the top of your screen if you have a question, so we don't have people talking over each other. Um, in the meantime, I think the only questions in the chat, Doctor Inlow, uh, I think you might have covered them. Let's see if I can go back. I think it talked about there were questions about uh, burning that you covered. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I see a David Kelly uh, asking about burning off Russian knapweed to get better herbicide contact, treat the following spring. Has this been tried? So, yeah, basically um, what's going, you know, what's going on there is if you are burning Phragmites, um, <clears throat> if you're carrying a fire through it when it has dried down, even without herbicide treatment, you're creating conditions that will result in very much more uniform regrowth the following spring. And so the recommendation has always been to, to uh, to follow those up and, um, and you can get decent herbicide treatment. In our experience, the combination of pre-burning like that followed by herbicide treatment can give you a bump in control. Um, you know, we've seen a 20% bump in control on other species like Kogon grass. With that, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't eradicate the rhizomes, you know, by a single combination of those, but it has definitely resulted in, in more uniform conditions for that subsequent herbicide treatment. So we think that's a good thing. All right, other questions. Come on now, we've got to have some questions here. We got a great group of folks here. I see uh, Paul uh, has a question. Yeah, so thanks for the presentation. I, I have a question on the, um, do you have any solutions that would make it, the herbicide enter deeper into the the, the plant? Uh, Actually excellent. provide a conduit or some kind of carrier? <laughs> excellent question. So basically the idea, the question here is, do we have anything that can facilitate the absorption of the herbicide through the leaves and then facilitate its translocation? So what we've run into uh, with these is we can overcome the waxy leaf layer. So we use adju adjuvants to do that, a good non ionic surfactant, you know, a methylated seed oil, uh, you know, um, strongly enhances the absorption of the herbicide through the, the leaf, uh, through the cuticle, through the cell wall, in, into the actual uh, um, leaves themselves, which is a good thing. So we can get the herbicide into the leaves. These herbicides are phloem mobile or systemic. So that means that they are gonna be subject to uh, the activity, you know, the direction that the phloem is transporting things, which is typically to the lie, the sinks or the active growing areas or active storage areas. So this is where herbicides begin to be dependent upon the physiology of the plants. Um, and so we have not found true synergists that somehow accelerated or, in, or enhanced um, that type of accumulation of herbicides. There's been a lot of work done on that, um, but it, with glyphosate and amazapir, we don't have any herbicides in particular um, or any, any other additives or anything that are going to sort of stimulate that or drive that to occur in a, on a greater fashion. So there we are at the mercy of the, the physiology or growing conditions of the plants themselves. So I hate to say it, but that, that's, that's the best we can do right now. Uh, Dave? Hi, uh, I've got. I wonder if it makes sense to remove the old standing growth. Let's say late midsummer, go in, chop down the old growth, uh, force the plant to regrow, and then wait a couple months for that regrowth and spray it. Then uh, August September time frame. Um, one to, so that I don't have that old standing biomass capturing. Uh, the chemicals that's being sprayed, but also trying to set it back to get it to regrow uh, and then catch it again um, 
with the catch it with the spray to to get a better kill. Is that does that make sense? Is that going to be effective or not? All right, Dave. Excellent question there. And so what you're talking about is a multi-step process. So so in the spring it comes up, it puts up uh, the the stalks, and you're talking about sort of a, an intervention. Then knock it all over, mow it all over, do whatever. And so you're you're sort of setting it back. Um, when its rhizome reserves are lower and then it regrows again and then hit it again, typically with an herbicide on, on that second sort of uh, um, second application or second uh, intervention there. So that strategy, you know, is effective. It doesn't, you know, it's not going to completely wipe the rhizomes out. Um, but uh, but in general, it, it's a multi-step strategy. Um, if people have time to do that, if you can deal with the biomass in that first step, then it has been a way of sort of facilitating a, maybe a little bit better herbicide control. Um, yeah, we've got, I mean, we've got be, like- It needs to be just, studied better. So we've got like um, five or six small patches. So I'm hoping with a hand crew to get in there, knock, that, the, knock down that old standing dead biomass, reset it back a little bit. Cause I'm not gonna be in there with a large piece of equipment, but it's gonna be hand crews going there knock that down and then it may be more effective as the crews are standing off to the side trying to spray to the center we, we get more contact on the regrowth if they're small patches absolutely yeah cut it all once it comes up let it regrow to about four to you know four to five feet tall and then you'll get much better spray coverage over the top absolutely on small patches the more intensive effort you put forward now on small patches the more time and pain you're going to save yourself down the road before they become large patches so absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? So I don't see any in the chat. I don't see any hands coming up right now. Here's what I would say. Um, I would encourage you to drop me an email if you have additional questions. If you think about things later, if you just wanna talk Phragmites or other invasive plant problems, um, I am very happy to do that with you. Um, I've worked across the country on a lot of different species and uh, definitely um, through my work with Armando, I'm very happy to uh, to work with you and to talk about the issues you're facing and the strategies that you're employing and whether or not you might be able to do a little bit better. So thank you very much for your time. Again, it's an honor to be here with you today. Next Wednesday, we are going to talk about Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus altissima. And in this case, this is gonna be a really cool discussion because I'm bringing in uh, Steve Manning from Invasive Plant Control. He's a contractor, he's got a lot of experience with the DOD, and him and I are gonna have a conversation on Tree of Heaven. We're gonna talk biology, we're gonna talk um, the problem, but we're also really gonna talk uh, about control. And, and we're gonna let Steve share some experiences uh, he's been really aggressively going after Tree of Heaven for the last, oh boy, 25 years with IPC. Um, and so I encourage you to tune in next week if you've got Tree of Heaven or other woody invasives for that problem because there's a lot that's going to be applicable there. And uh, so same time, 1 p.m. next Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to that too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Inlaw. I truly appreciate your Appreciate your time, your presentation. Do you have time? There's a follow-up question. In oh, the yeah, chat. absolutely. And um, by the way, I, I am willing, I'm happy to share this presentation with anyone. So if you want a copy of it, I can I can make it either available to Armando and he can share it with you through the through the uh, through your team site. Uh, I'm happy to do that. So just let Armando know and I will get him a get him a copy of it up uh, so he can upload and share it with you, okay? Let's see. So let's see. Last question uh, regarding grazing of Phragmites. Is that the one we're looking for? Right. Um, do you have any examples of treatment and details that help with control? OK, uh, Ryan. Um, so. Basically, what we're going to need to do in that and where you where are you uh, where are you located? If you can type that in the chat box, that would, that would be good or, or just turn the mic on. Hear me? Yeah, I don't recognize this. Yes, sir. Office. Yeah, uh, Central Kansas. I work Central, at Lake Virginia. Ah, Central Kansas. Okay. Um, I think some of the best grazing work has come out of Utah. And um, if you send me an email, what I can do is 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 work to put you in contact and, and with the resources and publications on uh, the the grazing stuff. Okay. 
Very good. Thank you. And thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you for the questions and uh, participating. Dr. Endo, we had our peak of uh, about 80 participants about midway through. So Excellent. I'm very pleased with that. Um, next week Thanks. is Tree of Heaven. Also, I'd like to thank Doug Burkett and the Armed Forces Pest Management Board for hosting this for us. Much I, more I see Doug, Doug's got his hand up. Oh, he does. Let, go ahead, Doug. Maybe he has his... Doug, do you have your mic off by accident? Because <laughs> we can't hear you. Huh. All right, well, um, I don't know if Doug's got a system failure in his end or, or uh, <laughs> but. Uh, he talks to us all enough. We, if you need a follow up with Dr. Enlo, we can arrange that. So, oh, sorry, I figured yeah. out I had, I had one more switch. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so in any case, uh, as I was saying, as I was talking to myself, uh, Stephen, that was just jaw dropping good. And and uh, from Colonel Carter and from the uh, uh, Pest Management Board and Natural Resources Community, uh, we just owe you a great deal of. of uh, uh, Thanks and and, and uh, for the outstanding presentation and, and look forward to the same place, same time next week for uh, uh, Korea Heaven and mention of Lantern Fly, which is a super big deal to us. And, and uh, wow, that was just amazing. And, it, and and hope you don't mind that we share your video on our on our website. Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely, no problem at all there. Thank you for the kind words, Doug. I really appreciate it. So let's we'll see if we can do it again next week. That's right. Look forward to next week. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Inlow, and uh, we'll uh, we'll be talking more later next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Armando, I'm going to.